All right, folks, hopefully uh, everybody had a quick break there. Uh, at this point, I want to start our second panel. And this one is entitled DER and Standards Governance in Australia. Uh, what can we do to set up a system that works for everyone? And so on this panel, we have Rod Dewar of Fronius Australia. And so representing the equipment manufacturers. Uh, Darren Gladman, Clean Energy Council of Australia. And I, I believe that you're a, a major stakeholder and you uh, bring together developers and others that are involved in building clean energy. So another important part of the solution. And then Chuck Wells, who is a software provider. So we have a pretty diverse panel as it is, uh, representing, I suppose, everyone. We haven't included the end customer, uh, we don't have uh, the actual utilities on the on the line here, so which is a little bit unfortunate. But hopefully they're in our audience today, and so we can get them to share, or get you to share your thoughts here as well. All right. And so uh, first of all, what I'd like to do is uh, is just show a um, this chart that uh, uh, Rod pointed me to. And th that would indicate how, uh, at least as of the end of last year, uh, how Australia was looking at setting up uh, governance for uh, how all uh, these different activities would, would work. And so I wanted to use this sort of as, as, a, as a backdrop uh, for this, this conversation. And, uh, and with that, maybe, Rod, we can lead off with you uh, and uh, on asking this question uh, about setting up uh, governance in uh, uh, Australia. First of all, what have your experiences been in working in the various governance and standards uh, making bodies that exist both in Australia and if you uh, uh, participate in any of the international standards bodies, you know, how does that work? Of bringing Australian needs to uh, to either to the to uh, a local body or to an international body, either of those points of view. So, Rod, could we, uh, if you would, please give us your thoughts? Yep. Okay. Can you hear me, everyone? Oh, yeah, Tom. Sounds great. Yep. Good. Um, yeah. Look, um, I'm on various uh, different committees um, within the industry, so I'm. Part of the 4777 committee, um, also 5033 committee, um, which is the PV installation committee as well, um, and various other ones. I'm also part of that, um, the DEEP, if that's how you want to pronounce it, um, uh, device standards um, task force on there. Um, from what I've seen so far, or my experience so far, um, it's it's been fairly good. Um, the, the, let's say the, um, the want to engage more stakeholders and more of industry um, seems to be be there. Um, in terms of the um, the deep governance structure or where that's at at the moment, um, that slide that I sent you, as I said, that was back from, from March, April, um, which is a little while back. And I have tried to get in touch to find out where that's at at the moment because there was a bit of a change in the direction uh, of where all this is going. Um, and I can see Matt uh, Hyde is there on the, on the caller as well, so he's probably got more insights to that than um, than I do. Um, but yeah, I think it's been quite good. I think there is in the general industry and the committees I've been, um, uh, there's a general good intent to get as many stakeholders involved uh, as possible um, without overdoing it, I guess, and to make sure that all parties um, have input to where this direction is going. Um, I mean, especially with all this interoperability between DRs is going to be, I think it's a huge change of, of where the energy um, industry is going um, and that needs to be really well thought out. So, um, yeah, I guess that's kind of my experiences so far. I don't know if you haven't got any more direct questions. Yeah, uh, Rod, that. Yeah, I want to follow up with you uh, a little bit. You know, and when we were preparing, I, I asked you to, uh, to represent the point of view of a, of a manufacturer. Uh, and, and then, secondly, since as it is, this is your your country, that of a consumer, 
And I know it was a little bit different, difficult to move between those those two different roles. So maybe just focus a little bit uh, on from the point of view of a manufacturer. So how is it how's it working? You know, Fr Fronius, which is based in Austria, right? They they probably get market requirements from hundred different countries, and uh, of which uh, Australia is is one. And so how is that working? Uh, you know, for you of uh, both, you know, wrangling resources and getting the right information such that you can go make your case back to the factory uh, to deliver the right products. Yeah, right. Um, so uh, the experience there has been quite good. Um, I think with engaging with the, yeah, especially DNSPs or utilities here, um, also AEMO. Um, I mean, I'm speaking from a Fronius uh, um, perspective, I guess. Um, being involved with these uh, committees, um, do feel that had a fairly good voice here. Um, I see there's quite a few other manufacturers or people from um, other OEMs and things on the call as well. Um, quite a few of them I know because they're also on um, similar um, committees. I think the main thing from a manufacturer perspective, I guess, which um, I guess I'll probably speak for um, for pretty much most manufacturers is um, having the ability to get some consistency uh, around the country, I guess. Um, and Darren's uh, probably has a lot to say about this one as well when he when he gets a chance. But um, is yeah, I guess one of the reasons. Uh, just as an example, the like say the twenty thirty dot five. I know there was um, industry. Uh, let's say stakeholder engagement um, and also uh, let's say you know a consultation I guess with um, which standards uh, manufacturers would would look to adopt perhaps um, or you know obviously yeah, the 61850 um, and your yeah, 2030.5 and OPNADR and there were various others were mentioned um, and to get feedback of you know what how manufacturers see that and especially in Queensland uh, there was a paper and consultation put out to, to get feedback there, um, which was which was really good. Um, so I think over, I mean, I've been in the solar industry 10 years now, and I think over the last few years uh, that has really improved um, the engagement um, that is taken up or let's say consultation phases. Um, may not always turn out the way you want it to, but I think it's been fairly good so far. Um, and I guess, yeah, as I said, I think, Having those consultations and getting manufacturers to really uh, express, um, you know, their thoughts on these on these matters, and I think most of the things, one of the reasons, I think, or at least from Fronius' perspective, with the 2030.5, um, it's definitely uh, wouldn't say it's like the the be all and end all of a standard. It's not, uh, you know, it's not not everything is correct in there, I guess, or it doesn't have advantages everywhere. But I think from from the point of view from an OEM having to implement multiple various uh, protocols for various countries, um, that's where the really resources and, um, uh, and difficulties come along. So hence, you know, choosing the 2030.5, although it may not be perfect, um, I think from, at least from Fronia's point of view, you know, obviously it's been used in the US, um, is made kind of sense to do it here in Australia as well, um, uh, you know, a big part, as I said, being um, you know not having to develop multiple different protocols for each country, um, etc. And so within Australia, I think the the one of the key things I think from a manufacturer is really to try and get this consistency around the whole country. Um, you know, with the the CSIP Oz being there, and then uh, having a lot of uh, conversations with the utilities. Um, I think the utilities also um, have made a fairly good uh, impression so far in wanting to um, get some consistencies at least with these type of protocols. Um, let's see where that heads, I guess, so. Right, very good. Darren, let's let's go to you next. And if, for, for those that uh, aren't, aren't uh, aware of, of your organization, can you tell us a little bit about what your organization does? And, uh, and then, and again, what's your take uh, about the current process does it work for your constituencies and what are the uh what are the challenges that that you're finding either in terms of getting information or um you know working through issues and, and i guess i'll say that I'll, I'll leave it there i'll ask my next question uh next time let's just start there 
Yeah, great, thanks. Um, a lot of people on the call are probably aware of CEC's role, but um, for those that aren't, Clean Energy Council is an industry association, um, but we have a lot of involvement in standards at many different levels. Um, so we, we have a, a significant role in implementation um, by maintaining lists of um, products and what standards they meet. And those lists are drawn on by regulators, distribution networks. Um, they're used for rebate eligibility um, and um, for um, many other applications. We have a lot of engagement that we encourage between distribution networks and inverter manufacturers mm -hmm. around how those standards are implemented through grid connection rules. Um, we, um, we have input into development of new standards and we're also very active in um, advocacy around regulation and policy and how those um, capabilities provided by those standards are used in terms of market frameworks, governance and uh, government policies. Um, this is a really timely webinar. Um, it, it would have been even more timely next week because um, um, I think the uh, for those of those on the audience who are Australian, you would be aware of some of the processes that are going on. Um, for those who are not Australian, um, we very recently had the Energy Security Board and only yesterday the Australian Energy Market Operator released reports that highlighted um, the challenge of um, minimum demand um, that's coming upon us pretty quickly where the duck curve from DER brings us to a point where there's very low um, synchronous generation and um, the you know system security challenges that presents means that we need to think pretty quickly about how we're going to implement um, some form of remote control of DER. Um, and a lot of that work, um, a lot of that thinking is going down the track of um, uh, IEEE 2030.5, use of dynamic operating envelopes, et cetera. Um, but probably the most, um, imminent thing and quite exciting is that I expect possibly as soon as tomorrow, but I would expect certainly, um, well, certainly this month, but possibly as soon as tomorrow, um, we're likely to see publication by the Australian Energy Market Commission of its um, initial discussion paper on a rule change proposal that the Energy Security Board lodged some time ago on um, governance of DER technical standards. And if I, I mean, that could go in many ways, but if I look into my crystal ball and predict how that might go, I think one of the issues that they'll need to come to terms with is that in our current uh, regulatory framework, some standards go pretty much directly from adoption as an Australian standard to implementation in. Um, state uh, regulations without any sort of um, regulatory impact assessment process um, in the uh, on the way. Um, now the AEMC um, last year adopted the Australian standard AS four triple seven into four triple seven point two, the product standard, into the national electricity rules, which um, Clean Energy Council strongly supported because we think that's um, good governance, good process, um, more transparent and um, brings everyone onto the same um, common, common set of standards and platforms. And I expect um, we're likely to see a similar approach um, to other standards in future, which I, I expect means that um, conversations like this and within standards development processes will then need to go through a process of consideration of business impacts, consumer impacts, cost benefit analysis and the like um, before they're adopted in the national electricity rules and implemented across the country. Um, that's probably a good six month process ahead of us before we get to that point. Um, 
And I think there'll be a lot more in that conversation. I think it's going to be a really rich conversation. Um, and so, yeah, anyone on the this webinar who is keen on being part of that conversation, um, look out for the um, uh, consultation papers in the coming few days or few weeks at, at most. Excellent. Love, love it when we break news. Now, uh, Matt Hyde, I believe that you're on the line here as well. Uh, and, and Chuck, I'll get to you in a moment, but uh, uh, Matt, uh, can you add anything to the to this topic? Yeah, sure. Morning, morning, Tom. Morning, all. Um, uh, as Tom just said, yeah, Matt Hyde here from AEMO, and um, you know, I, d I dabble a little, little bit from AEMO's perspective with a bunch of other people around here on um, you know helping to work across industry in in you know building the markets around um, DR interoperability moving forward. And Darren's bang on that AMC uh, rule change to set up a DR governance structure should be should be coming out within a within a week or two, if not earlier. Just to um, add a little bit more colour to the the chart Rods wisely put up there. Um, whilst the AMC goes through the process to set up uh, that DR committee, the structure you can see on your screen there's evolved a little bit since um, late December. And the way it's working now is that um, ANU's taken the lead on the, the standards and interoperability piece to keep that moving along um, whilst the AMC's DR governance structure gets set up. So like Darren's mentioned, there'll be a six or nine month rule change process. And then um, by the time you've got the committee up and running, you can probably pretty comfortably add another six months onto that. So before that real formal formal rules based structures set up and and in place which you know you can pretty quickly get to a year and a half if not two um uh the the deep is is established what's now called the interoperability steering committee um it's been led by Lachlan Blackhall out of ANU to to keep progress moving in the in the development of the standards that we're talking about here today and and that we think um you know we're going to need moving forward very good. Thank you for that, Matt. Uh, Chuck, next I'll, I'll, I'll go to you as a software developer uh, working in, in country. Uh, you know, again, how do you relate to this? I mean, you're obviously you're not living in, in, in Australia, so it's a little bit hard for you probably to participate in these working groups. But so how does your company uh, work in this environment? And, uh, you know, again, what, what advice can you give uh, to our hosts here? about how to get um, more companies like yours to, to come to the table and, and offer their points of view. Well, good. I, I have a couple comments that are directly related. And um, one one is, um, let's go back to the smart gateway device we conversation we had a few minutes ago. Uh, one of the issues we face in our implementations is the inverters that we communicate with typically do not operate fast enough to do for good control and what i mean by good control is, is let me explain that for a minute mm -hmm. today when we communicate with an inverter say we use modbus or sunspec modbus the fastest we can send commands to the devices is, is five times per second that is not fast enough the inverter itself can operate much faster it can operate 60 hertz or 50 hertz but we need a way to make the interfaces to the inverter uh, fast. And the only way that we've been able to do it in the past is with analog analog inputs. You know, so, so and, and let's ask the question, why do you want to control the inverter at 50 hertz? The reason is, is that we're losing inertia so fast in these grids that we need to be able to respond fast to contingencies. And the inverter equipment itself is fully capable of responding fast. We don't have that interface that will respond fast. So that's a big, been a big heart bit, heart burn for us for many years. And like I said, only with analog inputs can we make the inverters run fast. Now, so that's that's an issue I, I think that the inverter manufacturers need to address. Now, some of you, or probably the majority of you, will, may even disagree with me that we should control the inverters uh, at that speed. But recall that the dynamics of the electric power grid 
is very fast. And if you have a feedback control system, which, you know, I think are going to become more common, feedback control systems can, can if they're fast enough, can dampen out oscillations. They can, um, they can kill uh, inertial frequency response very fast if they can get commands fast enough to make that response. So that's an issue that we see that needs to be addressed. So now, <clears throat> now you may also ask the question, well, how can you send commands to an inverter over 2030.5 at that rate? I, I can't guarantee that I can send it at that rate, but I know I can send commands, you know, at maybe once per second. And then the smart gateway device then can do the interpolation between this one second commands to give me the type of closed loop control response that I think is really necessary. And from what we've recently read in the, the recent IEEE uh, Power and Energy magazine that's dedicated entirely to issues in Australia, uh, both South Australia has uh, significant problems with the uh, loss of inertia, same way with um, Western Australia. So in our minds, the way we can solve this problem is to provide a faster control device for the grid. And that means the inverter manufacturers have to provide us with a tool that we can send commands at higher speed. So that's, that's one thing. Now, the other thing that I think is significant that this group should be aware of and, and, and address, and that is there's another 2030, dot, 2030 standard it's called 2030.7. That is the microgrid controller standard. And uh, there's a companion that goes along with that called 2030.8. That is the testing standard. In, in order, in our opinion, in, and we've discussed this in the first session, when we're having hundreds of thousands of DERs that want to participate in the market, I believe they all, they have to be formed in a, a microgrid structure where the microgrid structure can be dynamic, uh, probably initially it will be fixed, and, and it will be at locations like a, 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 a switch in a distribution system, or it even could be a virtual location in the network. But it is a point in the network where all flow into and out of that microgrid go through one point. So that, that we typically call a point of interconnection to the grid, a POI. So with microgrid control technology, this 2030.5, one can control the flow into or out of, in that, of that point with very high precision to get a response in, you know, maybe um, 30 milliseconds to a command. So this is the type of control we think is necessary. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly possible to do. As I said, it is possible to do today with analog with analog signals, but it's not possible to do that with the current uh, most of the current manufacturers that, that we've dealt with. So that's a that's another issue. So so in order to accommodate these high volumes of DERs, we believe that the, the gr distribution grid should be decomposed into, into smaller connected microgrids and controlled as such so that each, each microgrid may have 100, 200 DERs that it is controlling in order to control the flow of real and reactive power at that point of interconnection. Now, uh, great, great thoughts, Chuck. And as you predicted, uh, some people are going to agree with you and some are, are going to uh, not. And, and we've seen that a little bit in the chat. So now my follow-up question to you is, let's say that, that uh, I mean, you, you, you're a believer in this concept. And based upon the, the scheme that you see laid out here on the screen, and it's understood, yes, it's going to change a little bit. But I think structurally, it sounds like it's about on track. So if you were to, what, what challenges do you think that you'd face dealing, for example, with the standards and inter interoperability group, or, or how do you get your, how do you get a, a seat at the table? How do you get a voice so that you can make your needs known? Well, that, that's a good point. Um, I, I do feel that the, uh, 
One of the issues that I think is going to loom very quickly, and that is uh, the work done at ANU on dynamic operating envelopes. I think this is an incredibly important subject that um, you know typically has been glossed over. But in order to operate the distribution system, we're going to have to be able to operate within an, an envelope uh, that will change perhaps every five minutes based on the weather, based on the condition of the topology. So, so whoever is controlling those DERs need to be aware that in order to keep the grid stable, each DER has to operate within this envelope. So there's two issues we, that I see that are quite important is, one, I believe that uh, this issue is not being taken as seriously as it should be, because I don't think it, the, the effect of the conditions on the distribution system uh, are not recognized by the people who are controlling the grid. So it, to me, it's very important, and I, um, uh, Lachlan, Lachlan's work at ANU, I think, is very directly related, and hopefully, it will be um, more uh, more people will recognize the importance of this. In other words, a dynamic operating envelope simply cannot be a maximum and minimum real and reactive power rectangle. It is a shape that is dependent on the net network topology, and the network topology will change during the day. And also, the loads will change during the day. The generation will change during the day, and it will change at rapid intervals. So these, this is an important uh, concept um, that you know we we would like to get more involved with because we understand the importance of having this this uh, constraint that is going to be used to keep the grid stable. Okay, very good. Uh, Rod or, or Darren, would you like to, to weigh in on this and, and on from the standpoint of, okay, so we have a market constituent that has a, a strongly held belief and could offer solutions in the space. So how, how do they work in your, in your marketplace uh, to get a voice? And Darren, uh, well, Darren, if uh, maybe we'll start, start with you. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, well, look, I'd, I'd have to, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't plug my organisation and say one way you can have a voice is having it through us. And so anyone who's on this call who's interested in this subject matter and is not a member of CEC, you can follow up with me after this call. Um, I think um, one of the things that we're, that would be really helpful um, and, and I'd encourage um, Sunspec or anyone else to, to provide some guidance on this is we need a kind of a high level roadmap of how this is going to work. Um, so I think the work that's being done to adopt IEEE 2030.5 for Australian conditions is really exciting. Um, seeing that adopted as an Australian standard in future will be very helpful. Um, it's very encouraging to see a, a number of distribution networks are starting to invest in IEEE 2030.5 compatible servers, developing APIs. Um, and I think where we need to get um, a bit of agreement across the board next is the step after that, is that um, over to aggregators, or I know notice in the chat, there's been a lot of talk about microgrids, but I think perhaps in Australia, we're thinking more about aggregators, is the next step integration of um, the DNSP and the aggregator. And then when we take this down to the device level, is that something that is essentially uh, left to the aggregator and the household or the inverter manufacturer to sort out? Or is there a role for government in, and standards development in telling us how um, the aggregator and the device communicates and how perhaps even devices behind the meter are orchestrated. I think these are some of the areas where um, input from people with experience in overseas markets like California would be really helpful to, to guide that next stage of the implementation in Australia. Um, Rod, what do you think of that? Yeah, no, I think that's... Um... <clears throat> Definitely a good point. Um, I mean, just to, um, um, I'm happy to give a, I wanted to say that before as well. Um, 
a plug for the CEC as well. Um, I feel they do a lot, um, especially over the last um, two or three years. They've done a lot of bringing a lot of various stakeholders together with different uh, various directorates uh, and meetings, um, etc. And um, yeah, just want to say you guys are doing a pretty good job there, Darren. Um, that probably doesn't get appreciated enough sometimes. Um, but yeah, um, I would definitely agree on some of the things you said there as well, um, like the uh, kind of a roadmap um, to see where it's going, which is yeah, probably pretty difficult, um, I think, to uh, um, to, uh, to lay out. Um, but um, yeah, no, I, I agree with pretty much everything you said there. So. All right. Well, I want to react to the, the the challenge put forward about the roadmap. So Sunspec certainly uh, has a, a roadmap for IEEE 2030.5 in terms of how we develop and, and support or, or support support the development of that standard. And so one of the things that to, what we have done is. Uh, we develop these profiles kind of like CCF Oz. Uh, we're developing one right now for uh, vehicle charging. Uh, we're uh, developing another one for the uh, uh, the meter that goes on the side of the uh, of a residential house uh, to talk to its its DERs uh, for for doing some some local uh, balancing, and uh, and we have a variety of other uh, similar profile work that's that we have taking place uh, to better control energy management systems and the like so that's that's one part of the roadmap uh, another function that i personally feel is that i also chair this ieee 2030.5 ecosystem steering committee now uh, this year we've only met uh, i think twice so far this year so it hasn't been that uh, often COVID's kind of crimped our style uh, but that just like the rest of the group is is intended to be an international group and the when we look at ecosystem maturity what that means is you know certainly how good is the standard how well is it adopted where is it adopted but also is there education uh, available for it uh, what are the common pitfalls or hurdles that one needs to uh, overcome when opening up a new marketplace like Australia, for example, and, and the like. So we have that roadmap that to, we also take into consideration for the overall um, maturity of the IEEE 2030.5 ecosystem. Now, I would say one of the challenges that as a standards developer that we all face is the fact that we're spread out over 24 plus different time zones. And uh, uh, most of the committee work in the US happens in the morning, probably the same as in Australia, right? And uh, uh, and so that's at the beginning, you know, so beginning of our day is middle of middle of your night, basically. So we have to figure that part out. And I think this workshop is is an effort to do that, to see what we can do to, to, to bridge these different uh, time zones. Because that's, this is what certainly what I've noted also, and Robbie, I'd welcome your opinion on this too is uh, the challenge we have uh, of getting uh, folks involved in the technical committee where you can go influence the core uh, you know the core standard uh, I, I think we have similar sort of time zone challenges there but I welcome your thoughts um yeah sure so you're, you're asking me tom yes um yeah so uh IEEE at the end of the day is a global organization, um, and so so it is a uh, it is a problem that's been tackled time and again. I, I serve on the IEEE Board of Governors, for instance, and we have a member from Australia there. So um, there are ways we can work to either stagger our meeting times and 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 make sure that we uh, provide some equity um, in terms of location. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty much a solved problem. And you look at like IEEE 802, right? It's used uh, globally by, by folks in many different time zones and, and people participate from many different time zones. So certainly if we had um, folks from Australia that were interested in participating in the 2030.5 working group, we would uh, make uh, sure that we, we meet at times uh, that's equitable to everyone. Okay, 
All right. So I guess, yeah, when thinking about the more, more popular standards, yeah, the problem has been solved in, in those cases. So, yeah, good point. So it's really just a matter of doing the outreach and, and getting our colleagues to join in. Uh, now, we had another question that came in from Dave Bradshaw, and, and he asked about the IEEE 1547 standard and about the fact that that was written into U.S. federal law back in 2005 under the uh, Energy Policy Act. And is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? So what that Energy Policy Act uh, effectively dictated is that uh, all distributed energy resources must comply with this IEEE 1547 standard uh, as and in, in where it uh, is, exists in its revision cycle at any given time. And so is that a good thing or a bad thing? I, I would say it's clearly a good thing. Uh, what, what we've noted from the manufacturers is that there is a reluctance uh, to move to adopt uh, state level requirements unless there's an actual law. And so it's helpful to move the manufacturers. And then uh, the US system, which I, I believe was uh, Australia maybe operates somewhat similarly, we set federal law then the federal law needs to be converted into state law, state level rule, rulemaking. And, uh, you know, in this country, uh, they, the states get effectively about two years to come on board with the, the latest uh, uh, version of IEEE 1547, sort of plus or minus. And so we're in, in the midst of that um, uh, integration, if you will. And so the magic date for the U.S., is about July of 2022. Uh, by that period of time, there will be about 34 states that will have come up out, out of the 50 that will have come up with uh, uh, pretty firm statements about what they're going to require for smart inverters and and for uh, smart DERs and, and data communication. And so, super useful. And uh, again, to, to to move that manufacturer market and to focus the attention of the, of the developers. And you just solve so many of the economic problems by doing that. Turns out to be a really good good idea. Rod and Darren were wiser referring to uh, on you know a, a work plan moving forward and some um, some structure given around um, the next phases of interoperability um, development moving moving forward. And just coming back to the what I was mentioning earlier on, on the ISC and, and the roles and responsibilities there. So I'm just reading from um, from the scope of those committees and the ISC being the, the steering committee um, is looking to, you know, provide some high level overarching strategic direction in that space. So some identifying the priorities and coordinate and steer the activity that will that will underpin the transition and, and some technical recommendations for interop that's going to support the development of energy policy. So that's kind of like the high level picture that the, the ISC will be looking to do. And, and then we've also got um, one of the groups that, that Ben, who was on earlier, is leading and, and the, the next phase of the, uh, the CCIP Oz work plan is to look into the the no regrets technical work plan um, that can identify the, the key areas in cyber and communications, computation and control infrastructure requirements that, that can support the integration. So um, both of those committees are, are pretty embryonic. Um, ISCs had, had a couple of you know meetings to, to kick off and establish the terms of reference to this point in time. And um, Ben's piece um, that he was he was leading, you know, literally just a few weeks back. Uh, put out the, the CC Boz um, is now moving into that, that technical work plan space. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, or if, you, if you're still there, if you've got any more colour you can add. I think you've, you've covered it pretty well, thanks. Sorry, Tom, I'll shut up. All right, well, sounds good. No, those are great, great comments. And so it sounds like it's a call to arms. It sounds like you're, you're in the That's midst. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way to phrase it. Of, of, of bringing everybody together and so, Sounds like the door's open and please come and participate. And uh, uh, okay, yeah. the, the, uh, the parting comment I can uh, offer on, on this, uh, which is I think I probably even mentioned it before, is I think one of the things that, uh, that the US market has done reasonably well 
uh, California, let's just talk about California, my home state, is uh, is engagement. And uh, uh, man, this is this is a tough transition that we're all trying to go through. And communication, like I mean, interpersonal communication, is absolutely uh, key to understanding. So here, here's to diplomacy, and, and by all means, please do engage. All right, and with that, we are now uh, six minutes past the top of, of the hour. And so we're gonna take another five minute uh, bio break here. And then we're gonna talk about uh, where things get real. So we have networks put into play and uh, what about security? What about cybersecurity and how do we take care of, of that important endeavor? So let's please join back here at uh, 11 minutes past the hour and then uh, we'll, we'll conclude with the great session on cybersecurity. Okay, we'll be right back. <laughs> 